recording so we are being recorded starting from this moment and um, the video video will probably be available on the latvian association of anthropologists youtube account in a couple of days and and um, uh, if you want to have access to this video in kind of other format just uh, let me know we can all work, work it all out okay so welcome to the first online event in our narrating the human series that is organized by the Latvian Association of Anthropologists, uh, the National Library of Latvia and the Riga Stradinj University. And originally uh, when the COVID numbers were kind of uh, low, uh, we had this idea that we would uh, hold this talk at the National Library, but of course, for all kinds of safety reasons, we just did, decided to move it online. And um, well, that's the kind of beauty of these online events that people from, from the people who otherwise wouldn't be able to, 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 to join talks and seminars or workshops can do it. And, and I'm very happy to see that there's so many people joining us today as well. So my name is Eva Puzo. Uh, I am the chair of the Latvian Association of Anthropologists, and I will be kind of introducing Michael in a bit, and uh, after the talk, moderating the conversation to the extent that it's possible in this um, in this format. Uh, so basically, a couple of requests, please um, keep your microphone microphones muted throughout the talk. Hold your questions until the end of the talk and um, then ask your questions by raising your hand, the blue little blue icon in the participant section, or typing them in, in the chat box. Um, so allow me to introduce Michael a bit. Um, so Michael, Dr. Michael Stromiska, he'll be giving a talk, uh, Why Latvian Higher Education and Latvian Society Needs Religious Studies. And uh, Michael is Associate Professor of World History at SUNY Orange with a PhD in Comparative Religion from Boston University. He has published articles on modern paganism and new religious movements in Iceland, Lithuania, Latvia and the United States. He serves on the editorial board of Nova Religio, the Journal of Alternative and Emergent Religions and is the editor of the volume Modern Paganism in World Cultures, World Cultures Compared to Perspectives. In January 2020, he came to Latvia through the Fulbright Fellowship Program to teach anthropology of religion at Riga Stradinj University. He has remained in Latvia during the COVID-19 crisis and is currently working on a book titled On Christian Eastern Europe, Pagans, Jews, Gypsies, and Muslims. And uh, here Allow me to switch my hats a little bit and, and uh, speak at the head of the social anthropology program at Riga Stradinj University and allow me to express my joy that Michael has decided to, to stay in Latvia a little bit longer and also um, teach our students next semester as well and continue our collaboration. I'm very happy that, that uh, we can make it happen. Um, okay, so Without much further ado, Michael, the floor is yours. Well, thank you for the very kind introduction, Ava. Let me start by saying I'm very happy to be with you all today here, if only in this virtual remote manner. <clears throat> I thank Eva and also Klaus Sedlenitz of Riga Stradinj University, the Anthropology Association of Latvia, and the staff of the National Library of Latvia for putting this event together and allowing me this opportunity to speak with you on a topic that I have long cared deeply about, which is the value of the study of religion, not only as a worthwhile component of higher education at the college or university level, but also as an important element of general social understanding. And let's see, oh, I can't seem to move the slide. I think I have to, um, uh, let's see. Oof. I definitely want to advance the slides here since I spent all day making them. So I don't quite know what the problem is. Okay, I, I think I'll do it from this view. Um, okay, so let's go to the next one. And yeah. 
Very good. Okay. And what I mean to say is that not only is it interesting for scholars and specialists with a deep interest in such matters as cultural diversity, world history, and social dynamics to study about religion to gain further insight into these things, <clears throat> it is also important for the broader public to develop better understanding of religion, even if they say or think they have no particular interest in the subject because we live in a time of ever increasing social diversity and understanding more about the variety and variability of religions in our society is an excellent way of learning how to cope and coexist with people who come to us with such different religious traditions that they might seem at times to be living in different worlds. <clears throat> I would furthermore assert that as Latvia is a land with a complex and multi-layered social history, so is it also a land with a complicated and multi-dimensional religious history, and very likely an equally complicated religious future laying ahead of it. It is therefore to be expected that better understanding of Latvian religion will help its citizens arrive at a fuller understanding of the Latvian past and a fairer and more inclusive perspective on the Latvian future. It is also the case that we live in a time of deep anxiety and despair about our fundamental value and the meaning of life. And when we have those dark nights of the soul, when we wonder what is it all worth and whether human life on this planet is a joke, a mistake, a tragedy, or perhaps just a random mutation like the coronavirus, it is often religion that we turn to, even if we firmly believe that we do not believe in any religion, which is in itself a kind of belief. We may think, I'm sorry, this is the case because religion is often among the oldest and most durable elements of any culture, and one that continues to shape and guide how we view the world and our place in it, even if we think we have discarded religion and entered the blissful state of pure scientific materialism, unapologetic consumerism, and absolute faith in computer-generated algorithms and statistics. We may think we are done with religion, but that does not mean religion is done with us, as we often continue to use the categories and mechanisms of religious belief and ritual to shape and structure our views of the world and our attitudes about ourselves and our society. For those of you who have some interest in religion, perhaps a background in Christian theology or church history, what I have said thus far may seem like music to your ears. How nice, you may think. This American ac academician is making a case for the relevance of religion as a foundational element of modern culture, so he must be building up to a nice statement of the Christian basis of Western civilization. Well, if this is where you thought I was heading in this lecture, I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you. My argument is not that we need to be more aware of Christianity, but of religion, that is religion in general and religion in the many forms in which it manifests itself. I am not here to make a case for or against Christianity as a superior or inferior form of religion, but to suggest that in the educational sphere, we should endeavor to put Christianity in context as one form of religion among many and to open it up for examination and comparison in relation to other religions. Christianity may be the dominant religion in Western societies, but it has never been the only religion in Europe or anywhere else. And if we truly want to understand the significance of religion in our world, we have to take note of the varieties of religion that exist around us now and in the past and seek out the common structures and patterns of religious belief and behavior, as well as the points of variation and divergence. <clears throat> it is relevant to mention something that a great 
19th century German scholar of religion, Max Müller, once said about religions. He said, he who knows only one knows none. This means that if we truly wish to understand religion and not just flatter ourselves that whatever form of religion we are most aware of or most attached to is the best, we have to set aside any commitment we may have to any particular religion and think about religion as a universal human function, like breathing or dreaming or thinking. This brings us to one of the central dilemmas that we face when we talk about religion and religious studies. In Western countries that have long been dominated by one form of religion, that is Christianity, there is a tendency to take this form as the most significant form of religion or even the only form and to perceive all religions through this one lens. If a religion resembles Christianity, it is seen as possessing value, but only to the extent that it resembles or is related to Christianity. If it is different, the differences will be counted as shortcomings and defects. This line of thinking begins from a standpoint of Christian privilege or advantage that creates an immediate disadvantage for non-Christian religions and their followers. In a society where only religion is viewed as valid, life can be very difficult, even dangerous, for those who are not Christians. If you are a Christian or have Christian ancestors, this may not mean much to you because you have probably never had to feel afraid or ever had to suffer consequences for being a non-Christian. <clears throat> if you had been a Jew in Latvia in World War II and members of your family had been led out to the forest to be shot and killed, you would see it differently. But the Holocaust has now faded in popular memory or even worse, become for many younger people an old boring story that they do not think is relevant to life in the high tech 21st century. This fantastic wonderland of TikTok, self-driving cars, and supposedly endless economic opportunity. So let me reframe and update the example to make the discussion a little more timely and interesting. If you were a German Jew in the city of Halle in October 2019, when an anti-Semitic terrorist came to the door of your synagogue, eagerly hoping to kill some Jews, you would know fear. As you would if you were an American Jew learning about the mass shooting at the Tree of Life synagogue in the city of Pittsburgh in October of 2018. This is what it means to be in the religious minority in society, which only sees one form of religion as valid. I can imagine that when I speak now of religious violence, the first thing some of you will think of is the recent killing of the 47-year-old French school teacher Samuel Paty by the 18-year-old French Muslim Abdullah Anzarov, a refugee from Chechnya, <clears throat> who was apparently aided and supported by several French Muslim boys even younger than him. Since this has been so much in the news recently, I will take a few minutes to reflect on this situation as a case study of sorts. I must warn you that I may disappoint some of you in my analysis because I am not going to tell a simple story of a heroic French teacher and a horrible young Muslim even if that is the story some might prefer to hear. This tragic event is, I would argue, of a somewhat different order than the other two killings mentioned above, because it was undertaken not out of hatred of another religion, but in, in an angry response to what the killer perceived as unacceptable disrespect toward his own religion. And what I say here, I do not mean to in any way excuse the killing of Mr. Pati, but only to show how this situation looks somewhat differently when we take the religious dimension seriously without any assumption of Christian superiority. 
According to the viewpoint expressed by many news media and also the French government, Mr. Paty was a noble hero standing up for free speech, and Mr. Anzarov was an irrational terrorist who killed for no good reason. Is it really so simple? Might there not be a further context here that we need to consider? I would point out that Muslims in France are often a poor and disadvantaged minority population who suffer both racial and religious discrimination. Though many French citizens today declare themselves to be non-religious, which would apparently also apply to Mr. Paty, Catholics still represent perhaps 40% of the population with the long history of Catholicism in France giving further weight to the Catholic religion as the dominant faith of the country, even among those who have rejected it. They still know it's there. In this context, when a person of the majority religion, a person in a position of authority, that is Mr. Paty as a school teacher, feels free to express what those in the minority population take as scorn and disrespect toward their religion, the minority population may experience an overwhelming sense of indignation, humiliation, and anger because they sense that one of the only things that provides them with a sense of security in this world, their religious faith and sense of identity, is being devalued and destroyed by an arrogant and unsympathetic member of the majority population who apparently has no idea of what their religion means to them. This was indeed a recipe for disaster. And by the end of it all, both the school teacher and his assailant were dead and France was in turmoil. Notice that in this situation, the action of the person from the majority population, Mr. Paty, has been generally interpreted in a highly positive light as freedom of speech, even though it is obviously severely upsetting to some in the society. While on the other hand, the reaction of the person from the minority is seen as having no meaning or value beyond hateful criminality or insane religious <coughs> fanaticism. This is an issue that looks differently, depending on whether you stand in the place of the majority or the minority. Mr. Paty's display of cartoons that were perceived by Muslims as extremely insulting is viewed as perfectly fine and even praiseworthy as an example of the glorious freedoms of the French Republic, whereas the angry response of Mr. Azarak is seen as totally irrational. Again, I do not condone violence or murder, but I would argue that we should consider why it is considered by some fine and noble for a French teacher to insult French Muslims, and why there is so little sympathy for the pain and humiliation that moved an 18-year-old teenager to murder a school teacher and to in turn bring about his own death. You do not have to agree with Mr. Azarok's violent action to acknowledge that he was a member of a religious com community that often experiences disrespect and scorn in Europe, and that Mr. Patti undoubtedly aggravated these feelings with his behavior. <clears throat> By engaging in a display of cartoons that he obviously knew would be offensive to Muslims because he warned Muslim students beforehand that they might want to leave the room before he showed the cartoons, Mr. Patti had clearly calculated that the possible pain and humiliation of Muslims like Mr. Azarak was of no concern. And his desire to stand up for free speech, he either failed to acknowledge the very raw emotions that his Muslim insulting free speech performance would provoke, or he simply did not care. News reports suggest that in the days before he was killed, Mr. Patti was surprised at the angry responses produced by his use of the cartoons, 
and he had apologized to his students, which, however, failed to soothe the violent passions that Mr. Patti had unwittingly unleashed. Mr. Patti's failure to anticipate how his lesson might make Muslim students and other Muslims feel is a classic case of the arrogance of the majority who often either assume that the feelings of the minority are of no importance or may not even be aware of them. In this case, the minority was the Muslims of France. While we lament the terrible death of Mr. Patti, we should not overlook how this course of events was not only the failure of one group, the French Muslim minority, to respect the principle of free speech, but also the failure of another group the French majority represented by Mr. Patti to make any effort to respect or understand the religious sentiments of the disadvantaged Muslim minority. Let me ask you to consider this situation with a few elements rearranged. Let us imagine that Mr. Azarak, a Muslim, is the teacher and many of the students are Catholics. The teacher announces that today, the class will have a lesson about free speech in relation to religion. He tells the students that if they are Catholics, they may want to leave the room because the day's lesson may be offensive to them. He then displays a series of satirical cartoons that show Catholic priests having sex with young boys, Catholic nuns using crucifixes as dildos for simulated sexual intercourse, and the Pope watching child pornography. Some of the students are amused, but some are furious at seeing their religion represented in this way by a school teacher in a public school. Mr. Azarak, the teacher, explains that in a free society, it is perfectly fine to insult other people's religion because respect for free speech is much more important than respect for anyone's religious faith or religious identity. That night, an angry Catholic student attacks Mr. Azarak and kills him. When police arrive and point their guns at him, the angry young Christian refuses to submit to their authority. He dies in a hail of gunfire, shouting in Latin, I will gladly be a martyr for my church. End of example. I ask you, in this scenario, do you think the response of the French media and government would be to celebrate Mr. Azarek's demonstration of free speech and to attack his Catholic assassin as a deranged killer with an evil religion? I don't think so. I suspect that given this scenario, many in French society would praise the Catholic student as a young person of deep, if misguided, religious faith and condemn the Muslim teacher for engaging in a tasteless and unnecessary assault on the religious sentiments of French Catholics. It is easy to imagine that right-wing Catholic politicians like Marine Le Pen would begin calling for the expulsion of Muslim teachers from French classrooms and French news media would show President Macron traveling to Rome to meet with the Pope and making statements about the need to protect the religious feelings of the French Catholic community from insulting attacks disguised as free speech. I would note that in the weeks following Mr. Patti's killing, Mr. Macron has made little effort to engage in dialogue with the Muslim community or Muslim religious leaders in France instead focusing on condemning radical Islam and launching investigations against numerous Muslim organizations and individuals, including those dedicated to better relations between Muslims and others in France. This strategy of Mr. Macron's is no doubt pleasing to French people angered by the killing of Mr. Patti and may well help boost Mr. Macron's political fortunes but it is unlikely to reduce tensions in France. In fact, it is likely to be disastrous for French society. 
as Mr. Macron is likely to seek further political advantage with more anti-Muslim speeches and gestures, French Muslims are likely to respond with anger and possibly further violence, and Mr. Macron then likely to apply further repressive measures, provoking more Muslim rage, and thereby instigating a cycle of suspicion, anger, violence, and repression, with the majority French population fearing and hating the Muslim minority, and the Muslim minority fearing and hating the French majority, and each side feeling completely justified in their hostility, fear, and anger. Bringing this back to the main theme of my talk, I would say that this could be described as a case of religious education and religious understanding gone terribly, tragically wrong. Although French society is famous for laïcité, a policy of secularism, which is supposed to provide for state neutrality in matters of religion, we can see in the actions of the French school teacher and the French president, not an attitude of, of neutrality toward Islam, but one of hostility and distrust. If a teacher wants to teach his students about religion, in this case, the religion of Islam, in a fair-minded, neutral manner, he or she should not do what Mr. Pati did and present the students with highly controversial materials that many members of the religion find offensive and insulting. Mr. Pati also seems to have failed to realize that the current situation in France, in which the Charlie Hebdo killers are on trial, is a time with many raw emotions in the air with French Muslims feeling under great pressure and stress, making his decision to build a class around cartoons mocking the holiest person in Islam, a particularly unfortunate and insensitive choice. I would argue that if you are a teacher trying to teach students about religion in a fair and balanced manner, you should not focus exclusively on the most offensive or horrible aspects of the religion because that puts the religion in the most damning and biased light. If you are trying to teach students about freedom of speech, you should not ex explain this as the total freedom to insult and offend other people in any way that you like, secure in the knowledge that even if you provoke them to the point of violence, you will not be considered at fault only the person who committed the act of violence. Something that seems to be seriously lacking here is any understanding of the need to show sensitivity and respect to other people's feelings about their religion and their identity. As an ed educator, Mr. Pati could have done so many other things that would have been more truly educational and less likely to be offensive. He could have explained about the history of Islam, how it shares with the religion of Judaism and also some forms of Christianity, a very serious and profound idea that God is something or someone beyond material form that cannot and should not be represented in human artistic media, whether paintings or sculptures, or in this case, mocking cartoons. He could have mentioned the 8th century iconoclasm controversy in the Byzantine church in which arguments about whether or not images of God were acceptable brought the Byzantine empire to the edge of civil war. He could have explained how in Islam, this principle of non-portrayal of the divine was extended to prohibit artistic renderings of the prophet Muhammad, understood as the messenger of God. He could have explained how in many countries, actions that are perceived as insults to religion often lead to social conflict or even violence. If he had done this first, he could have then helped the students understand why the Charlie Hebdo cartoons were so offensive to certain Muslim individuals that they felt the need to resort to violence. He could have then had an intelligent, well-informed and respectful discussion with the students about the inevitable tensions that arise between freedom of speech on the one hand 
and respect for religious faith on the other. All this could have been done not to justify religious violence or killings, but to help the students understand the reasons and passions that led to the tragic death of the Charlie Hebdo cartoonists. But Mr. Patti chose instead to present his topic in the most inflammatory, insensitive, and offensive way possible. Having myself been a teacher in a classroom where I taught students about similar subject matter, I cannot imagine that Mr. Patti did not know he was running a serious risk of insulting and provoking his students and the larger Muslim community. Perhaps he was naive. Perhaps he was inexperienced and got in over his head in waters that were much darker and deeper than he expected. Unfortunately, he paid the ultimate price for his decision to approach a very delicate, emotionally raw subject in the most blunt and offensive manner possible. The French government has now given Mr. Paty a posthumous medal as a hero of the French Republic. But I find his, his approach to teaching about religion deeply, indeed fatally flawed. To my thinking, the first purpose of religious education should be, encouraged to, should be to encourage students to have a basic measure of sympathy and respect for other religions based on an understanding of religion as a basic element of most, if not all, human societies. And here, Mr. Patti fell short. Perhaps you are now asking yourself what any of this has to do with Latvia. France is another country far away and with very different history and traditions. You might furthermore say that religion is not a major issue in Latvia. Perhaps you think, yeah, there are some Lutherans, some Catholics, and some Russian Orthodox believers, along with the occasional old believer here and there, with some nice old cathedrals and basilicas and Riga and other towns, and a smattering of smaller religious groups from the Krishnas to the Devturi. But all this is just not that important. Well, let me answer, I think you are wrong. All of this religious stuff may not seem very meaningful now, but it was definitely very meaningful in the past and could easily become more meaningful in the future. As a visitor to Latvia over many years, I have come to appreciate the many different religious traditions that are woven into the long arc of Latvian history, from the pre-Christian beliefs and customs of pagan Lacalians, Coronians, Salonians, Livonians, and others, to the several different versions of Christianity brought into Latvia by its various conquerors and colonizers from German Crusaders to Swedish Lutherans, Polish Catholics, and Russians of Orthodox belief, along with the religious activities of Jews and other minorities. It seems to me that to say religion is unimportant in Latvia is like saying the history of Latvia is unimportant because every phase of Latvian history has been marked by new forms of religion introduced by new populations. Even the communist period, which might seem to be the one authentically non-religious period of Latvian history, can be interpreted as the imposition of a new form of anti-religious religion after a fashion. After all, the Soviet communist dictatorship can be said to have had, however ironically, many of the trappings of a, of a religion, even if an officially atheistic one. After all, state authorities functioned not unlike a theocratic dictatorship with a communist cult of saints with Lenin and Stalin at the top, I ideological indoctrination and Marxist-Leninist teachings that had some parallels with dogmatic religious instruction, and the population was required to participate in regular communist rituals as surely as the ancient Romans required worship of the emperor or medieval Catholic authorities expected the population to undergo baptism and accept the Eucharist. Deviation from the sacred truths and ritual practices of the Soviet state was punished as severely 
as heresy or blasphemy in the Middle Ages. The new freedom of the post-communist period of the restoration of independence has been marked by increasing religious diversity with varied believers from Muslims to Mormons now practicing their assorted forms of faith, slowly altering the religious landscape of Riga and indeed all of Latvia. This diversity is not, however, something entirely new. Pagan traditions lived on even when Latvia's various Christian rulers might have preferred otherwise, and Jews were a rapidly increasing presence in Latvia in the 19th and early 20th century, and might very well have become an even larger force in Latvian life if the Nazi Holocaust had not intervened. The collaboration of Latvians with Nazis in the cruel mass slaughter of Latvian Jews will always be a dark and shameful chapter in the book of the Latvian nation, but the larger story of Latvia in history is of a generally tolerant attitude toward religious diversity, based in part on the historical divisions of the country with their different cultural and religious influences. Prior to the Nazi period, there had been far less anti-Semitism in the Latvia of the 18th and 19th and early 20th centuries than in many other Eastern European lands, certainly far less than in Ukraine or Russia. The brutal mob violence of the pogrom never showed its bloody face in Latvia. The striking absence of a very common European affliction is something Latvians can justly be proud of but you need some training in religious history to appreciate how unique this is in Europe. It is therefore not too hard to make a case that just as religion has played an important role in Latvian history and culture, so can the academic study of religion likewise play an important role in helping Latvians appreciate their history, their culture, and their identity. However, when we move from this level of pleasant generality to consider what exact form such religious studies should take, we enter a zone of conflict and controversy because different groups in society are likely to have very different ideas about religious education. Smaller and newer religious communities may be happy to simply have the religion mentioned in a respectful manner in classes dealing with religion, but larger and older communities, such as the Catholic or Lutheran or Orthodox Church, may seek a much greater degree of involvement in programs of religious education and may exert pressure through their connections with academicians and politicians affiliated with their forms of religion. We then get into the problem of whether religious studies should deal with different religions in a more or less equal manner, or whether certain religions, and of these, one religion in particular, should be accorded a more privileged position in the classroom to match their larger presence in society. I have to this point used two terms interchangeably, religious studies and religious ed education. And it is important to realize that the two terms are often used to indicate quite different approaches to learning about religion. When a person learns or studies about a religion that they are personally committed to in a class typically taught by a qualified member of the religion, this kind of religious education is in essence a form of indoctrination as the purpose is to educate the student in the proper doctrine and practices of the religion, as well as its history and possibly other matters. I will henceforth refer to this form of religious education as religious indoctrination, with this naming not intended to connote any negative valuation of this form of education, but just to highlight the essential nature of such instruction. In such classes, there is generally little effort to address the merits of other religions, or enter into any comparison with them as the program is intended for members of a given religion to learn more about their religion and become better practitioners and advocates of their religion. This is also known as a confessional approach. 
teaching religion according to the different versions or confessions of different churches or other religious organizations. Typical examples would be Christian education classes for children taught by Christian ministers, priests or nuns, or at the higher level, training in Christian theology for someone looking to become a Christian priest or minister or a professor of theology. I will speak of the alternative, more comparative model of religious education as religious studies, as this is the label most often applied to this approach. Religious studies comes from a different starting point and serves a different purpose. Here, there are two primary objectives. To understand religion as a universal category of human experience and to explore particular forms of religion, such as Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, or others, in their respective historical, social, and cultural contexts. Examining religion as a component of human experience around the world draws on such academic disciplines as anthropology, sociology, philosophy, and literary studies, and psychology. This approach assumes a certain neutrality toward religions, taking them all as meaningful cultural expressions that provide societies with values, beliefs, and rituals, cultural expressions whose features can be cataloged and compared, while leaving aside the question of which religion is good or bad, better or worse, or even, in the old Christian phrase, the one true religion, the one true faith. In the field of religious studies, we introduce students to many religions and provide the opportunity to explore particular religious traditions more deeply, but we do not tell students which form of religion they should follow or even if they should follow any religion at all. There is thus a built-in tension between the religious indoctrination and religious studies approaches. One approach focuses on promoting greater awareness of and attachment to a singular form of religion, while the other method is intended to foster a broader consideration of religion as a human phenomenon with many different forms without endorsing any particular religion over any other. As I understand the approach to religion in the Latvian school system, which I know has been through several different stages since the early 1990s, pre-university schools currently offer primary school students a choice between two options. The first is a Christian faith class that teaches basic information about Christianity without favoring any particular confession or denomination. And this is usually taught by representatives or one or, of one or another Christian church. This is, in my terms, religious indoctrination with no attempt to introduce students to other religions as would happen in a religious studies curriculum. The other option for students is a course in ethics, which would seem to be a course in moral philosophy and reasoning without any explicitly Christian or religious content. There may also be optional courses that are more in, in religious studies vein, but these are not required. They're optional, which lessens their importance in the curriculum. This arrangement with these two particular options is the result of a great deal of social and political discussion and would seem to represent a compromise between the desire of particular Christian churches to promote themselves and the desire of others for socially useful non-religious education addressing issues often associated with religion, such as personal ethics and public morality. It is, however, instructive to consider what is left out of this model. Neither the class on Christian faith nor the one on ethics provides students with much understanding of other religions besides Christianity. While it is true that this arrangement reflects the greater demographic weight of the big three forms of Christianity in Latvia, that is the Lutheran, Catholic, and Russian Orthodox confessions, and is in that sense faithful to social reality, there's a serious problem here. This program of studies leaves students in a state of ignorance and possibly ill-informed prejudice toward other religions that they may encounter in Latvia. For while it may be true that other religions from 
from the pagan Dievtari movement to the various forms of Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, and Islam have only very small followings, barely rising above 1% of the population, all of these small percentages add up to growing religious and social diversity in Latvia. And one would hope that the educational system would want to help the population understand and adjust to this emerging diversity, rather than convey a false sense that the only religions in Latvia that matter are the Holy Trinity of the Lutheran, Catholic, and Orthodox forms of Christianity. The fact that the only alternative available to Christian religious indoctrination for students is ethics instruction always ca also carries with it another unfortunate implication, even if it is unintended, that while Christianity is a valid source of ethics and morality, other religions are not. This privileging of Christianity over other religions also amounts to promoting a Christianized version of Latvian history and identity. This is of particular concern to the D.F. Turi and Jewish religious communities, both of whom can stake a claim to a long history in Latvia. D.F. Turi is conceived as a continuation of old Latvian folk religious traditions believed to predate Christianity, even if the D.F. Turi movement per se was officially founded in the 1930s. Religious education that omits not only the modern D.F. Turi movement, but the bare fact of Latvia having had a pre-Christian religious history and non-Christian religious traditions may be extremely pleasing to some Christians, but not to members of D.F. Turi or to other Latvians who believe that Latvians' native pre-Christian and or non-Christian folk traditions are important, if often unacknowledged or taken for granted elements in Latvian culture and identity. An avoidance of the Jewish history of Latvia is misleading and hurtful in a different way, in that it denies the once considerable Jewish presence in Latvia and furthermore suggests that the religion is not worth knowing about, despite its long history across Europe, its several centuries in Latvia itself, and also its cruel suppression in Latvia as elsewhere in Europe in the time of the Nazis. Silence on Latvia's Jewish history provides implicit, if unintended, support to the hateful teaching of Nazis and other anti-Semites that the Jewish religion is something that should be erased and forgotten. I would also refer back to the difficult situation now unfolding in France to illuminate another issue here. The problem of religious indoctrination producing an attachment to one form of religion without fostering understanding or sympathy for other religions does not only apply to classes in Christian religious education. Though I have not seen any specific information on this point, it seems very possible that Mr. Azarak, the young Muslim who killed Mr. Pati, may have himself been the product of religious indoctrination, a program of indoctrination oriented not toward Christianity, but towards Islam. We can only wonder if Mr. Azarak might have reacted differently to what he perceived as an unforgivable insult to his religion if he had had more training in religion in general and how, religious, how religions function in different societies. Any single religion indoctrination program risks indoctrinating young people in either ignorance of other religions or hostility towards them. These then are some of the problems with the Christian-centered religious indoctrination policy at the lower levels of the Latvian school system. As it now stands, it is an excellent method of perpetuating the religious dominance of the three main Christian confessions, but a very poor way of educating students about the past, present, and future religious diversity of Latvia. And yes, you heard me right. The future religious diversity of Latvia. It is a real thing and it is coming. 
The steady trickle of Asian students into Latvian higher education will inevitably mean a higher presence of non-Christian religions in Latvia. A certain proportion of these students are likely to start businesses here, marry Latvians, and become long-term residents or even citizens. They will worship at non-Christian religious institutions and will eventually and quite reasonably expect <clears throat> to see their religions respected as valid forms of religious faith and not treated as inferior to Christianity. Furthermore, younger Latvians who are mo more exposed to cultural and re religious diversity than previous generations, even if only through the internet and social media, are likely to be more and more curious about other religions. I would note that opinion poll research showing a decline of religious faith in Latvia, Estonia, or other countries in Europe often fails to capture the interest young people have in non-Christian forms of religion, which are often characterized as spirituality rather than religion per se. There is continuing growth in numbers of young people who describe themselves as spiritual, not religious. What they often mean by this is that they are quite interested in matters like reincarnation, yoga, meditation, Eastern religions in general, astral bodies, herbal healing, UFOs, ESP, and all manner of exotic and esoteric things, but that they do not attend church services or find Christianity appealing. Looking at this situation as a perhaps naive outsider without any of the battle scars that those of you who have been intimately involved in these issues may carry with you, <clears throat> it seems obvious to me that the best way to adjust Latvian education to address changing social conditions and generational attitudes in Latvia would be to move Latvian primary schools away from single confession religious indoctrination toward broader and more comparative religious studies courses that would embrace a more diversified view of religion in Latvia and in the world. However, it is easy to foresee that this will be no simple thing owing to the political power of the big three Christian groups. And I will leave it to you as to when or how or whether anything can actually be done in this regard in the foreseeable future. Let us Let's look instead at the situation in institutions of higher education, that is colleges and universities, which I believe offers a much more promising horizon. Here we can see much greater acceptance of the religious studies model, but here too we can perceive a certain privileging over Christi of Christianity over other religions. The University of Latvia offers separate bachelor's level programs in theology and religion, with the theology program focused on the intensive, intensive study of Christianity and the religion program following a more religious studies approach, allowing exploration of different religious traditions from around the world, from Eastern religions to Baltic mythology to ancient Egyptian religion. Despite the breadth and diversity of the bachelor's religious program, it still displays a certain Christian bias to it and a certain atmosphere of Christian indoctrination because courses in non-Christian religions are optional and elective, but courses in Christian history and theology are required. By comparison, the theology program only requires study about Christianity, suggesting the unfortunate result that one could gain a fine knowledge of Christianity and yet be ignorant of other religions. The overall situation seems to represent a compromise between conflicting impulses to advance the study of religion in general in a comparative manner on the one hand, and on the other, to promote knowledge of Christianity as the favored form of religion. There is also a master's level program in theology, but none in religion, hmm. An imbalance which, which again favors Christianity over other religions. At the doctoral level, there's a program in the theology and science of religions, 
which again seems a compromise between Christian-centric religious education and more comparative-oriented religious studies. The division suggests an unresolved tension between two different views of religion, one which sees Christianity as the most important or only religion, and another perspective which sees religion as something with many different forms. This reflects a political struggle we can see in many societies these days, what could be called a Kulturkampf, a culture battle, between two opposing visions of society and the future. On the one side, there are conservative right-wing forces hoping to preserve and defend an older vision of a more homogeneous society in which Christianity is dominant and other religions have little weight or voice or presence. The opposing side is, is comprised of liberal left-wing forces which embrace social diversity, including religious diversity, as the fundamental inevitable reality of our time which we, learn, which we need to learn how to live with. Obviously, for the more conservative leaning, an educational system which reinforces belief in Christianity and which de-emphasizes other forms of religion is very appealing. And for the more liberal-oriented, open-ended religious studies grounded in a more positive view of religious diversity is preferable. The divide between these two perspectives is very deep, but it is to be hoped that continuing dialogue can result in, product in productive ideas and initiatives respecting both long-established Christian traditions and identities, as well as alternative traditions and identities. Aside from the University of Latvia, there are no other institutions of higher education in Latvia that I know of that offer study programs focusing on religion. Several institutions do, however, offer religion-related courses. Riga Stradic University is one example, offering a fine course on the anthropology of religion in the social anthropology department within the Faculty of Communication. This is a course I am intimately familiar with as I taught it last spring and hope to do so again in spring of 2021. Looking at other universities in Latvia, it is not hard to locate study programs that could be enriched by broad, open-ended, comparative religious studies courses that would allow students to examine religion from different academic perspectives, or by developing courses that include discussion of religion in relation to other social and cultural phenomena. Insofar as religion is often interwoven into many areas, of social, political, and cultural life, such social science disciplines as sociology, anthropology, politicology, which in America we call political science, psychology, and history are all excellent platforms for courses that examine religious phenomena from social scientific perspectives. Business and management programs that include discussion of intercultural communication could benefit from including religion-related topics, as could media and arts programs, considering how prominent religious themes, images, and symbols are in popular culture, from Hollywood superhero movies to video games. To my colleagues at Riga Stratens University, with its glorious history as a pioneering institution of medical education, <clears throat> I would mention that the study of the interaction of religion with health and healing is a growing subfield in modern religious studies that would make a wonderful class at Riga Stradic. <clears throat> these possible inclusions and potential applications of religious related topics in these various programs all depend on viewing religion from the religious studies perspective, which provides a flexible and multi dimensional view of religion that is conducive to combination and collaboration with other viewpoints and diverse social and cultural contexts. The religious indoctrination style of education is of less utility here because it is inherently less flexible and diverse owing to the priority of promoting Christian values and doctrines. However, on the other hand, there is a growing Christian media industry encompassing everything from Christian rock music 
to Christian themed action movies and video games. And it is not hard to imagine people schooled in Christian indoctrination finding ready employment in Christian media production companies. The tension between Christian re religious indoctrination and broad based religious studies is not unique to Latvia. In Estonia, the University of Tartu has a school of theology and religious studies program organized along much the same lines as the University of Latvia. Until 2015, the school at Tartu was called simply the Faculty of Theology with a nearly 400 year history of teaching Christian theology. The recent addition of the religious studies component to some extent verifies what I have been arguing here, that with the growing social and religious diversity of the post-Soviet era, a Christian only program of religious education no longer makes sense and that an expansion into broader religious studies makes more and more sense. Let me end with one more American anecdote. The two largest religion-oriented academic organizations in the world are the AAR, that is the American Academy of Religion, a religious studies-oriented grouping, and the SBL, the Society for Biblical Literature, which is dedicated to Christian theology, history, and literature and related subjects. For many years, the two organizations would hold a joint conference of mammoth proportions, as many as 10,000 people attending. But in 2003, members of the AAR decided that they wanted to separate from the SBL and have their own meetings, which would feature a broad religious studies scope without what they saw as the more narrow Christian and biblical focus of the SBL. <clears throat> this was done for three years of separate meetings from 2008 through, through, through 2010. But after that, the members of the AAR reconsidered this academic divorce and chose to return to holding meetings jointly with the SBL. As this example shows, the relationship between religious studies and Christian theology may be a somewhat unhappy marriage at time, but dialogue may remain the better option than divorce. In conclusion, I hope I have succeeded in illustrating for you how the study of religion is both an important and socially relevant thing, and also a complicated one, given the inevitable tension between a long history of Christian domination of Western societies that tends to favor indoctrination in the Christian religion to any deep knowledge of other religions and the younger emerging field of comparative religious studies, which reflects the increasing presence of and interest in non-Christian religions here in Latvia as in other countries. And with that, let me end here and thank you for your attention to my meandering thoughts. Thank you, Michael, for, for the very thoughtful and I think thought-provoking talk. Um, I think we can take the questions now and comments and um, I think the best way might be to, as I mentioned earlier, to raise your hands in the participants section of of the of the zoom session or to write your question in the chat box or just write your name in the chat box and we can kind of uh, put you on the stage I think I droned on for so long that I numbed, <laughs> numbed people into a state of somnolence. No, I think it's more like, you know, kind of digesting the information. It takes time. <laughs> Okay, maybe I can start then. Um, I, I'm not really sure uh, to the, <laughs> about the extent to which I formulated the question. Um, and I hope I'm not kind of going back to the full on Christianity route that you were trying kind of showing uh, how we should kind of try to think, think about things differently. 
Um, but I was just thinking, especially in the Latvian context, about how um, how do we think about these evangelical Christianity movements in the sense that they're not necessarily part of what you call the three, three big main religious Christian confessions in, in Latvia. But at the same time, they're not these, necessarily the smaller group that you also discuss. So what are they and how do we maybe think about them? How would you think about them? Well, I, I do see them as offshoots of Lutheran or okay. Protestant religion overall. <clears throat> but being that they are, they are so, such small groups and they are so fast changing, they tend to spring up like mushrooms, you know, after a rain. And at least in America, you know, any, any town or city you go to, you'll find many small storefront churches where someone just rents a little space and maybe in front of 20 people, they create a church. So I don't think this is quite happening in Latvia yet, but it could be coming. And I think um, it may require some expansion of the discussion beyond the big three Christian groups, it, insofar as when there are times when the government or universities or school systems or, or whoever want to have religious input, they may have to start taking account of these people as their numbers grow. But being that their religion is Christianity, I would say, even if they are not consulted at all, a good deal of their religion is already represented in the school system because of the attention to Christianity. Whereas, say, a Buddhist or a Muslim group might feel very much disadvantaged if their type of religion is not taught about at all. Thank you. Let me see. I don't see any raised hands. I hope there is this kind of raise hand function visible to all of you because I don't, okay, yeah. One just came in, but could you okay. read it? I think it makes a, a better uh, flow. Okay, um, so the question is, why do you not separate between religion and spirituality? Especially taking into account that all through the 20th century, the level of religiosity in Latvia has been rather low among all major Christian denominations plus Jews although not true for smaller Protestant groups like Baptists, etc. Well, the, the reason I, I don't want to separate them completely, and believe me, I have uh, thought about this, is that there's so much overlap between different ideas of religion and different ideas of spirituality. I think it makes more sense to keep them together. However, in a careful discussion, I agree we have to break down the different categories. So what we typically refer to as spirituality, we might just consider to be personal religious interest that's not part of any organization. So then you have the difference between organized religion and personal religion or spirituality. So I, I think it makes for a more meaningful discussion to keep these things together because they do interact with one another. And after all, spirituality often does concern things that are taken from organized religions or, or may function in opposition to or in contrast to them. So I, I take your point. There, there is a, some difficulty here in different things being put together. But when, but when many things share common elements, I think it is good to keep them together for purpose of discussion, although in some contexts you may indeed, indeed want to separate them and examine them separately. Thank you. Um, and we have a question, a question from Andres Brox. Andres, maybe you can. Uh, a couple Is more. it in the chat? Uh, hello, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, Michael. Hey, Andres. Uh, thank you for your good uh, presentation. Uh, Actually, I am from Bielturi, and I would like to ask how do you see situation in uh, uh, school education uh, about uh, religion and uh, actually uh, ethnic tradition, because there is uh, uh, simply difference. Uh, ethnic religion is very connected with uh, our traditions, and we can't uh, teach uh, ethnic religion uh, uh, equally with other religions and um, which is age where 
when we start, uh, when, when uh, you know, schools need to start uh, actually um, you know, offer studies in religion, not teaching without uh, indoctrination. To tell you the truth, I don't really know enough about the topic to give you much of a response. Um, but just on the face of it, it would seem to me <clears throat> that when students are introduced to religion in general, this should be mentioned as one of the varieties in Latvia, with some explanation of how it is connected to Latvian folk culture. That would seem to be a fair way of presenting it along with other religions. Thank you. So I, so I understand that this, is, this has been a, a matter of some concern to D.F. Turi for, for some years. Um, and I think it's just something to keep advocating for and discussing because I, I, perhaps I'm being biased toward my own point of view, but it seems to me that over time, the diversity argument is going to hold up very well because people are going to see more and more diversity around them. And when we consider diversity of religions, it would not make any sense to exclude the eftory. And secondly, when we think of Latvian history and identity as having different elements and also having a certain diversity, certainly the old pre-Christian elements are something important to consider. And that, again, would, would go towards supporting some instruction about D.F. Turi and related things. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So uh, we have a question from or comment from Liane Dotsene. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question. Um, if we return to the France, um, how can uh, we deal with the very narrow opinions that, uh, for example, Muslims just need to go back to their home and then practice their religion? Or for example, about Latvia, I don't know, maybe some Christians need to go back to their country and practice their, their religion. What can our attitude should be to, to these opinions? And even do we need to show some kind of attitude to that kind of opinions? Well, there are many different points to make in response. And, and let me start with a somewhat humorous one. If many of these people who are proposing the expulsion of Muslims are Christians, they might want to look to their own tradition and what it says about how you should treat the stranger and the foreigner and the person who's in need. <clears throat> this seems to be, <clears throat> excuse me, be a serious failure of Christian charity. <clears throat> but the broader question is really, how do you get people to respect and accept people who are different and who are other, especially in times when they perceive a threat from that group? And I think here, there is no simple answer. It requires the work of many different people. Excuse me, <clears throat> let me take a drink here. It requires, <clears throat> it requires the work of many different people to promote awareness of Islam as something more than just a religion of terrorism, and also to, to create more dialogue between Muslims and Christians and others. So I think what's so sad about a situation like this, and, I, and I'm not deeply versed in this French situation, I, I really just know a smattering from the news and I wanted to speak about this because I thought it exemplified some interesting themes for today. <clears throat> but as I understand it, there were indeed Muslim organizations and Muslim leaders in France who have been working to create better communication and understanding with Christians and others in France. But in a time of crisis like this, when something so violent and horrible has happened as the murder, unfortunately, the people who are anti-Muslim gain the upper hand for a while because passions are running hot, people are angry and scared, and they're likely to be very receptive to the message that Muslims are dangerous and we've really got to crack down on them or maybe even expel them. So in this particular time, it can be difficult 
to advocate for understanding, but it must be done. It can be done, but it's, it's slow work. It requires many organizations and individuals to work together. It also depends on the moral character of individual people, because we we all have the choice of how we want to treat others and look, look at others. <clears throat> and the more individuals can share between each other the need to respect other people and not assume the worst about them just because they belong to this or that race or religion or whatever, that can be a small victory in that battle. But you know, I am an American and I'm aware that after the 9-11 attacks, in America, it took years for America, for the majority population to calm down about Muslims and be more accepting of them. I was living outside the US in 2001. I returned in 2005, and I've been teaching there since then. And in my world history classes, where the, uh, topics about Islam come up for discussion, <clears throat> and I have students write papers on these topics, I really have noticed a long-term trend line of decreasing fear and hostility toward Islam to where when we get to the last couple of years, the students I have now who would have only been little babies during 9-11 and not been traumatized by that terrible event, they are now much more able to say, oh yeah, Islam, oh, that has some interesting things. And gee, I didn't know these Islamic cultures were so advanced. So these things do fluctuate over time, but I think when you get into a situation with something so shocking as the murder, <clears throat> and then you get this cycle of repression likely to trigger further violence, likely to trigger further repression, it is really a really a very difficult time. And those who can speak out for tolerance and give people more information about Islam, I hope they will do it. I think it's the only way forward. But there's no doubt it will be a difficult time for French Muslims for some months or years. Thank you. And we have two raised hands, um, Matisse and that's it. And after that, they can add the questions and then I can read the questions in the chat section. Uh, Matisse, go ahead. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Uh, yes. No, we can, yeah. Matisse? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how this works. Okay, uh, <laughs> here I am. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. It was really inspiring and very well organized and structured and really enjoyed it. <clears throat> I was thinking, and maybe this is rather a comment than a, than a question, but uh, Nobody has shown me from the side how for them looks our educational system. Uh, Matisse, no one has shown from which side? Education of uh, moral and ethics in the, in the school. Um, You're breaking up. Maybe that could have some sort of clash. or the break in um, in our relation uh, relations between those people who are tolerant Matisse, you're, you're yeah. really maybe you could even um, write it, it yeah. maybe yeah. better to write it in the chat yeah okay I'll, 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 I'll write it. I'll write it. yeah Thank you. Um, that's a, maybe you can ask your question because you you said that you uh, yeah, are supposed thanks. to be living. Um, yeah sorry. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to rush off soon after. I wanted to ask you if you could reflect on the genre of your lecture and also on the position from which um, you are speaking, because it's not entirely clear to me that this is a kind of an anthropological project of understanding. It seems to me that it is rather uh, a normative project that you're proposing. And therefore, that position, I think, you know, would be good to sort of have it uh, uh, on the table, from which position do we see the Latvian education system as we do, from which position do we see the French, um, uh, the most recent um, unfortunate incident in France that you described, and perhaps using that as an example, you know, I could sort of elaborate a bit, uh, because the, the analysis that you offered of the murder uh, of, uh, in France 
to me seemed to use both the the both the teacher and his murderer as sort of uh, almost metaphoric figures uh, that stood in for um, attention uh, between the French state and Islam, or, or authority, uh, divine authority in Islam, in a quite a simplified manner. I mean, not you or I, we know only what we know about the situation insofar as we've read the media. So it requires a pretty kind of large interpretive leap uh, to really analyze the situation in a meaningful way. But it does work for the story that you've put together. Um, in, in the uh, presentation. To me, it seems, you know, that we know very little in, about this um, a person of Chechen origin who, who you know, who has a very long and rich and interesting, perhaps, history about which we know virtually nothing. Um, the same about the teacher. We don't know what happened in the classroom. We also know that France has a long history of these kind of various tensions precisely around the not only about at people's attitudes and tolerance and religious diversity, but really by the nature of the French state. And many anthropologists have written about that from Mayanti Fernando, Republic Unsettled, Webb Keen on the Danish cartoon controversy that we also know about from uh, not so long ago, Saba Mahmoud, of course, also about blasphemy and things like that. So there's a kind of a long anthropological debate about this. So I'm just kind of wondering, you know, I suppose, how do we as anthropologists in these kind of crisis situations, what methods do we use to actually interpret these events that are quite uh, distant from us, right? And, and actually mobilize them in, in a really, in a normative project that you propose. Well, I'm afraid I, I probably can't give you a sufficient answer to, to what you're asking because this French case, I only thought to include a few days ago, simply because it seems so relevant to the general topic. So I, I don't claim to have deep knowledge. And as you mentioned, I was to some extent using it as a uh, metaphorical venue for getting at certain issues of the power relations between different religions and how this plays out in society, even when there is supposed neutrality between um, religions. My general viewpoint, I, I am indeed not a specialist anthropologist. My training is in religious studies. So in all that I'm saying today, I, I am reflecting on the field I've been involved with for a long time and noting the, the different tensions that, that I see coming out here and there. So I, I don't really have a, a more developed theoretical perspective to refer to for you beyond that, I'm afraid. I guess I meant to more like the ethical and moral position, right? Because how would you characterize it? It's one, I mean, I appreciate that, of course, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the difference between religious studies and anthropology and don't expect to kind of uh, give you an answer to that. But I suppose I meant really, you know, also the, the moral position and the political position from which you speak. It's not evident immediately, right? I think that that would be good to kind of name it because, you know, Latvia and France are entirely different state formations. You know, one is a national state and other uh, understands itself to be a secular state. So things like diversity mean very different things in these places. So what is the position from which we can see, you know, compare them and subsume them under a particular normative project of, you know, I suppose, uh, I don't know how you would name it, diversity or, or, so to me, like it seems, you know, the need to reflect on that space from which we can equalize or see them as equivalent um, entities. Well, for me, the, this grows out of many years research I've been doing on minority religions. So I've always been thinking about the relationship between the minority and the majority and the many ways in which minorities are inherently disadvantaged and how, how inherently many things in society will always favor the majority. <clears throat> and in recent times, my awareness of these things has also been sharpened by events in America, which could be typified as the Black Lives Matter movement, which have done so much to expose how um, in a very unequal situation, whatever black people do is often under suspicion and judged very quickly and punished very harshly. And the abuses of the white power structure often go unquestioned and unchallenged. So it, it's really out of these things that, that I formulate um, my position. And I would agree with you that, I mean, this is just a talk. This is just an attempt to raise issues and stimulate discussion. And I'm glad we're having this discussion right now. 
But in a more detailed study, of course, we want to better define how the different state structures operate in, in regards to religion. Thank you so much. And I'm really sorry. I'm going to check the sign off now. I've got to run. Thank, oh, thank you, you, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Okay, thanks. Uh, we are now turn to the questions in the chat, chat section. And there's a question common from Milda Lisowski. Michael, thank you for the lecture. Lecture French. Lisi. Mean that there are no classes of religion at public schools. In Latvia and Lithuania, there is a confessional religious education. I'm not sure about Latvia, but in Lithuania, one might see that indoctrination against other minority religions is happening. What in your mind should be the approach of scholars of religion in such case? I'm, I'm a little flummoxed by the question. I'm not sure where to go with that. Um, could you re repeat the last part of it again? I, I'm a little confused. Or actually, I, I can sum it up in the chat. Let me look at it. So, I guess considering that in Lithuania that there is indo indoctrination not necessarily in Christianity but against minority religions and how should we approach? Well, I, I think as scholars, you know, we can both serve as witnesses to what is happening with different religions and then we can offer our advice as qualified uh, contemplators of religion to, to state authorities as to what arrangements will better serve the purposes of religious coexistence and fair treatment. And I know that in the Lithuanian case, um, you and other scholars were involved in trying to help the, the pagan movement, Romova, uh, gain a higher level of legal recognition by the Latvian state, but this was blocked by certain quarters and it would seem largely by the Catholic church. So we see that these are very, real power struggles that come up when people attempt to make any changes regarding religion. <clears throat> it seems that in all post-Soviet states that I'm aware of, well, let me say many, I, I don't know if it's all, but there was a, a kind of rush to quickly assemble some kind of constitutional arrangement for religion after the collapse of the Soviet Union. <clears throat> And things were done in a very hasty manner, often referring back to laws and constitutions of the 20s and 30s. And in negotiation with different part parties in society, politicians relied a great deal on the most powerful religious communities and sought their advice and also wanted to, ha to have them feel included in this new democratic state. And I think unfortunately, arrangements were made that heavily favor majority over minority religions. And this, just from the simple viewpoint of fairness, needs to be addressed. Uh, however, uh, it, it is extremely difficult to do this because now, now that these arrangements are in place, there are political groupings that support these arrangements and will fight against changing them at, at all. So kind of similar to a, uh, my answer to Lien's question about, you know, what should we do when there's intolerance toward a certain group such as Muslims? <clears throat> I think we just have to keep standing up for fair treatment, try to improve public understanding of different religions, try to dissolve um, misunderstandings where we can, and hope that the overall tide of history is on our side. <clears throat> In recent years, of course, we have to wonder about that because maybe 15, 20 years ago, it seemed like everyone was happy about diversity and multiculturalism. Well, of course, everyone was not happy. And many of the unhappy ones who do not like diversity and who would rather see a more homogeneous society, including in many cases, a Christian society, they have now been getting getting their um, revenge in the last number of years, particularly in countries like Hungary and Poland. 
So it's just an ongoing battle. We just have to keep putting our shoulders to the wheel, try to educate the public, try to stand up for fair treatment of minorities where we can. I think that's all we can do. Okay, great. And uh, then uh, kind of uh, maybe also going in the direction of uh, wrap, wrapping things up, uh, the questions, comments from Patrizi and Matis, I think they go well together, so I'll just read them both. Uh, Patrizia writes, to return to cases similar to Samuel Paty and showing cartoons of the Prophet, what would be a good explanatory example of this kind of offensive content for atheists? Because it seems that to a large extent, the lack of understanding and empathy towards the Muslim community comes from the fact that non-religious people have a difficulty to comprehend what it feels, to, what it feels like to consider something sacred. And Matis writes, Religious education in school presumes we are educating two opposing societies, Christian and the uh, other ethics, quote unquote. Maybe that presumes a future conflict. Well, I, I see it more as representing a political compromise that Christian groups definitely want to be represented in primary education and then the ethics idea is a way of appeasing those who do not not want to be Christianized. So I, I don't see it as really, um, well, I, I guess you could say it's dividing society, or I, would, I was thinking more along the lines that it, it simply rests upon an already existing division. Um, but I think it, it is, uh, it is perhaps unfortunate though, because if students were learning about religions and ethics all in one class together, all the students together, all the religions together, or at least a variety of religions together, including discussion of ethics, then everybody would be getting an equal education. The way it is now, it's very fragmented and people may be getting quite different instructions in these topics. And I also know that, um, well actually I know this more from the Lithuanian case, thanks to Milda and other scholars, that um, there's a tendency when it comes to religious instruction in the, in the primary schools, to kind of farm it out to, to local religious groups and let them supply the, the teachers and resources. So this means a loss of control by the, um, the school authority over religion. And it's a way that the religious group actually claims territory for itself within the school, within the curriculum. So it's very problematic, and it seems to me it would be better to have a, a more neutral kind of religion class that tried to represent a variety of classes and could also deal with um, what is intended under ethics, et, uh, ethics instruction. Mm -hmm. And maybe going back to Patrizia's uh, question comment about uh, Violent the, the question of, uh, yeah, sacred, maybe it's all about. I have not, you know. well, I, I can't think of uh, people who have specifically committed violent acts out of atheism, but I wonder with, with some of our most spectacular criminals, um, whether they had any religious belief or in some cases did not have belief, and in that case is classify them as atheists. Um, I don't really have a, a clear um, answer, but to go to the second half of the comment, <clears throat> I think she was asking about um, whether um, atheists have difficulty understanding religious people. Is that what was there? The, the, the idea of the sacred, you know, that not com necessarily comprehending the idea of something being sacred, quote unquote. Well, I think for, I'm sure atheists have many things they hold as sacred, you just perhaps don't worship them in a church, but I'm sure they have ideals and values and areas of life they consider highly important, which would then be sacred. So I think you can find the same structure without some of the relig religious trappings. Just as, you know, think of it um, in popular culture, people treat movie and music stars and celebrities as, as gods, but they don't literally think of them as gods. But, in, but it's from like a functional point of view, in many ways they, they relate to them the way religious believers would relate to gods or saints or other holy uh, people. Thank 
you. Um, so I don't see any other raised hands and uh, nothing new in the chat. So I think this is our cue to, to thank you uh, for the talk and, and uh, for engaging in the discussion. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to see each other uh, you know, in person in post COVID times. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because like, under other again, circumstances, at this point, we would be, you know, getting up, leaving the library and going for a drink and something uh, delicious, but this is not happening today. So we have to postpone it. But right. Well, again, let, let me thank you and thank all the audience for very perceptive questions. And I'm really happy to have had this discussion with you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Okay, and I'm turning off the recording.